Hi guys, how are you? Hope you're well. I hope you had fun with chapter five. So now let's work on chapter six, microbial growth. Let's look at our learning objectives first, as we always do. So we have here, let me move my face over here so you can see. We're gonna define microbial growth, talk about temperature requirements, talk about pH, which is most appropriate for microbes, what are acidophiles when it comes to pH, osmotic pressure, oxygen requirements, biofilm formation, um, cute, different culture media that you can use to grow microbes, um, and what's a pure culture. And then we're gonna stop here in the second video, I'm gonna talk about growth curve, measurement of cell growth, direct and indirect measures, um, measurements, ways to measure the growth. Okay, so let's start by uh, talking about the requirements. So first, I forgot, let's um, define what growth of microbes is. So when you talk about growth, you're not talking about growth in volume or growth in size, you're going, you're talking about growth in numbers, right? Okay, so just keep that in mind. Microbes don't grow in volume, they grow in number. And then we're going to talk about the physical and the chemical requ requirements. So let's start with the physical requirements, talk about temperature. So there is always a maximum or an optimum growth temperature for microbes, because remember, they also have enzymes. And any organism that depends on enzymes need to have a specific temperature in their body, in their cells, so the enzymes can work properly. So the optimum temperature for our body enzyme is 36, 37 degrees Celsius, because that's the temperature our body keeps uh, our metabolism functioning. So that's the temperature that our enzymes need for, this, uh, for them to be very effective. Same thing here. So there are three main classes of microbes, the psychrophiles, the mesophiles, and the thermophiles. And there is one more type that I'm gonna show you in a graph right here. So if you look at this, you're going to see that, let me get my pen, pen going. You're going to see that the psychrophiles have an optimal temperature of around 11 degrees, right? And then mesophiles like a much higher temperature around, oops, 37 degrees Celsius. My pen today is kind of crazy. Um, and then, let me erase this so it doesn't look too bad. Okay. So if you think about what is room temperature, would you agree that room temperature is something around here? 25, 24, 25 Celsius, right? Okay. So, and then you have thermophiles and hyperthermophiles, which are usually, you can have bacteria that are thermophiles, but usually hyperthermophiles are the archaea. So if you think about my, so first, let's think about microbes that can survive at room temperature. Those are gonna be the psychrotrops, correct? Okay, psychrotrops. And then microbes that can survive at cooler temperatures, psychrophiles, right? Which microbes of this would you think are the most likely to cause disease in our body? Well, if our body temperature is around 37, do you think a psychrophile can cause a disease in our body? Meaning when they enter our body, the temperature is much higher than what they need and what they're used to. And with that, do you agree that they're not gonna be able to survive and function properly? So psychrophiles don't usually cause disease in us. But look at the psychrotrops. Do you see how they still do okay at a little higher temperatures? So they still do okay at 30 degrees. So they could find a way to succeed and survive inside our body, okay? 
mesophiles are usually the ones that can cause disease in humans. But like I said, there are psychotrophs that can still find a way to survive at 37 degrees, even though it's not their optimal temperature, okay? And I think I kind of explained why you don't see a lot of thermophiles and hyperthermophiles like the uh, archaea, the microorganisms from the domain archaea, causing disease in us. Because look at the temperatures that they like. 60, 70, 80, 90 degrees. So that's not going to happen, right? So they usually don't cause disease or are not uh, part of our microbiome. There are a few archaea, uh, archaea organisms that were shown to be able to survive in the human body, but it's still something under investigation, okay? So, when I talk about psychrotrophs, as you can see that they can survive at 30, 25, but they can also survive in temperatures a little above zero, that puts them in a class of microbes that cause food spoilage, okay? So they grow between zero and 20, can grow up to 30 degrees. So think about that food that you have, let's say you have a pot of rice, and that rice, I even have a picture of you here, of your pot of rice. And that rice grows at, um, it's hot, not gross, right? The, the, the rice is already cooked and the rice is cooling down. So when the rice is cooling down, if you have a bigger container of rice compared to a smaller one, this one is going to take much longer to cool down. So when you put this pot of rice in the fridge, if there was, there is a bacterium called Bacillus cereals that can grow in rice, that can contaminate rice. So if you put that contaminated rice in the fridge so this is the fridge temperature here right so the, the the food is starting to cool down but because of the large volume it, it cools down much slower than if you compared to a small pot of rice that can quickly reach the refrigerator temperature which is around four celsius you see the problem you are giving a chance to a psychrophile bacteria, psychrotroph, sorry, like the Bacillus cereals, to grow. And with that, they grow, they sit in the rice, even if the rice reaches lower temperature after this period of cooling, the bacteria is still there and it grew, right? And then next day you eat that rice. Maybe you don't heat enough and you eat it. And you can have an intestinal infection by Bacillus cereals. Okay, so you can have that type of issue with bacteria that are psychrotrophs and can grow in your food. The danger zone for bacteria to grow, it mostly the ones that we mentioned, is between 15 and 50 degrees. So that food that is sitting down and you say, oh, it's still warm, it's still like 60, 50 degrees, it's nothing is going to grow, that's not correct right? So food needs to be cooled quickly within two hours of use of being on the table to avoid growth of microbes. More than two hours at room temperature, 30, 40, 50 degrees, even if it's still a little warm, are temperatures that could allow growth of bacteria. And some of these bacteria produce toxins. So even if you say, well, I left the food out for like five hours, but that's okay. We're going to put it in the fridge and later we're going to re we're gonna reheat it. Remember, even if you reheat it, bacteria produce toxins. Toxins are not neutralized by heat usually. The toxin is still going to be present in your food when you ingest it, even if you kill the bacteria. And then you can get food intoxication. That is usually the case for Staphylococcus aureus, and we're going to talk about this later when we talk about intestinal diseases, okay? But just to give you some perspective here. Um, pH. pH is also something that needs to be 
a, at a certain uh, number for your bacteria to be able to grow. For example, bacteria like pH between six and a half and seven and a half. So you understand why they grow super well in our body, right? Molds and yeast usually like a lower pH. So they grow well in the skin, which has pH 5.5. Uh, and they like also the lungs, but they cannot grow in most of our organs. They, you don't see yeast and mold usually growing in the intestine, right? Which has a higher pH. Make sense? Okay. Acidophile are bacteria that, are, that like acidic environments. And usually what they do is they like the acid, they make acid through fermentation, and that acid keeps all their microbes away from them, okay? Which bacteria are like this? I think a good example is the lactobacillus. Lactobacillus is a gram-positive bacterium that produces lactic acid through fermentation, and wherever they are, they keep all their microbes away because of that acidic pH that the other microbes don't like as much as they do. Where do they grow and keep other microbes away? For example, in the vagina. There's a lot of lactobacillus in the vagina that has an acidic pH and they keep other microbes away. So if you have an imbalance in the amount of lactobacillus in the vagina, what happens is that other microbes are allowed to grow and you can have infection, in, uh, uh, vaginal infections. See? The deal here, for example, candida is also present in the vagina. If lactobacillus go down, candida that were, are supposed to be kept at a low level, remember, they like acidic because candida is a, a fungus, they start to grow because um, the lactobacillus number is low. So that imbalance can cause other bacteria and even fungi to grow, okay? Osmotic pressure. What is this? Remember, osmosis is the ability of a certain environment to bring water to it depending on the amount of solute that is present there. So when you think about osmotic pressure, you always think about uh, how much water is going to get to that environment because there's a lot of solute. Um, there are bacteria, for example, if we eat a lot of salt, is that good for us? No. Why? Because when the, there is too much salt in our blood, that carries water with it. And with a lot of water in our blood, we're increasing blood volume and we're increasing blood pressure. Okay? What happens here? Here, the bacteria don't have blood vessel, right? So what they have is that cell wall, plasma membrane, and the cell within, right? If you put the bacteria in the presence of a lot of salt, and the bacteria is just a, bacteria, a normal bacteria that doesn't love salt, look what's going to happen. The water is going to move out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the cell is going to shrink. And this is called plasmolysis. Okay? Here is plasmolysis. So the other, oh, if you keep the cell in a solution that has the same percentage, for example, of NaCl, than it is within the cell, which is around 0.85%, nothing happens. Water is going to move in and out without any problem. But again, if it's high salt in the exterior, water is going to be trying to move out to equilibrate the concentration between what's in the cell and out of the cell. So you bring more water out to try to equilibrate the concentration. But what ends up happening is the cell shrinks. Why is the cell wall intact? Because the cell wall keeps the shape of the bacteria, right? So the only thing that really shrinks with the bacteria is the plasma membrane. <clears throat> there are other bacteria, for example, Staphylococcus, uh, all the Staphylococci, Micrococci, that are called halophiles. They like high salt concentration. 
We know that also fungi are halophiles. They don't mind having a high osmotic pressure. So if you put them in a, in a solution that is full of salt, in the case of fungi, you can even put them in a solution full of sugar, they're okay. They don't die. Okay? So that's called halophile. Some organisms are extreme or obligate allophiles, which is they require the high salt. Some are facultative. They can tolerate, but they can also live in a regular salt concentration. When it comes to chemical requirements, remember that there are different um, compounds, um, at, um, chemical elements that we need, that the bacteria need to survive. So the main one is carbon. Remember, any, any organic molecule, what is an organic molecule? It's a molecule that has carbon. An inorganic molecule, it's a molecule that does not have carbon in its composition. So they need carbon to make their sugars, to make CO2, to make their proteins, to make their lipids, everything. Okay, so carbon is absolutely necessary. Nitrogen. Proteins have nitrogen. DNA, RNA, ATP have nitrogen. So you, they totally need nitrogen to survive. What some bacteria can do to use nitrogen and to also give nitrogen to other organisms like plants and us is they get the, high, the nitrogen gas from the air and they fix it. They fix it in the form of nitrate or nitrate. Nitrate nitrate or no nitrate sorry or nitrate and o2 minus other bacteria can degrade ammonia which has nitrogen or nitrate in nitrate into nitrate or nitrogen gas okay so some bacteria build bitter mo bigger molecules of nitrogen some bacteria break it down when they build something bigger, we call it nitrogen fixation. And why is this important? Can we absorb nitrogen gas from the air? Can plants do it? Can animals do it? No. So bacteria do this. And then the plants absorb this nitri and nitrate and nitrate. And we eat the plants or we eat the animals that eat the plants. So we get the nitrogen that we need, that we could not get otherwise. See, super important. Nitrogen fixation is vital. We're just here because bacteria do nitrogen fixation. Okay. What else? Sulfur, present in some amino acids, present in some vitamins. Amino acids like cysteine have sulfur. Okay. And, um, most bacteria decompose proteins for the sulfur source. So they decompose and then we can absorb the sulfur with the plant, with the animal that we ingest, okay? Um, and phosphorus, super important. DNA, RNA, and ATP are phosphorylated, right? Um, trace elements. Other, en other elements can work as enzyme cofactors like for example iron copper molybdenum magnesium zinc uh, manganese all these are inorganic substances that are needed for bacteria and for us um, now changing subject still talking about chemical requirements let's talk about oxygen let's talk about oxygen requirement bacteria some bacteria require oxygen to survive just like us some bacteria don't require but don't mind the oxygen some bacteria cannot stand the oxygen and they die in the presence of oxygen so let's talk about these different bacteria and what they are so bacteria that require oxygen are called obligate aerobes Okay, we're going to see an example of this in the lab, which are the pseudomonas. It's one example of bacteria that loves oxygen, cannot live without oxygen. Facultative anaerobes, all the enterobacteriaceae or the bacteria that grow in our intestines, 
Klebsiella, E. coli, Salmonella, what else? Um, trying to remember one more. Well, I'll think about the names later. There are five or six uh, enterobacteriaceae that are um, facultative anaerobes, meaning they don't need oxygen, they can survive and make their energy via fermentation, but if there is oxygen present, they use it, okay? Obligate anaerobes absolutely hate oxygen. Best example here, Clostridium are obligate anaerobes, okay? They cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. So usually you find Clostridium really deep in under the ground where there's no, not so much oxygen available, okay? And we're going to talk about why they can stand in a minute. Aerotolerant are bacteria that tolerate the oxygen but don't use them, differently from the facultative anaerobes that can use it. And microaerophiles are bacteria that use only a very specific concentration of oxygen to survive. If there is more than what they need, they die. If there is less than what they need, they die. So now, Let's look at this experiment here, made with ox to test oxygen requirement. So this is an agar dip medium. Let me see if it says agar dip somewhere. Agar dip. My pen, my pen is has a delay and I'm not able to write well. I'm sorry, guys. Agar dip. It's an agar that is solidified inside the tube and the bacteria, and then you inoculate the bacterium with a needle. So you just put the needle in your broth that has the bacteria and then you inoculate, you kind of inject it in this agar. You make a poke, like you poke a hole in the medium and then the bacterium grows here. They, where do they grow? That's the question. And what's the answer? Well, it depends on their oxygen requirement. If they require a lot of oxygen, where is the oxygen? Right here. So they're going to grow on the top. If they like oxygen, they're here. But they don't really need oxygen, and they can also ferment and grow in the bottom of the tube where there's not a lot of oxygen, then they're here. These are the facultative anaerobes, right? This is the obligate aerobe. The obligate anaerobes, obviously, is going to grow on the bottom. The aerotolerant can grow anywhere. They don't care the oxygen present or not. It doesn't matter. And microrophile, they grow in a specific uh, height of the agar, not higher, not lower, okay? If they are higher or lower, they would just die. So we're going to see this experiment in the lab, okay? So when I say, so this is now we're talking about obligate, I'm going to insist with this pen, but it's really hard. Obligate, whoa, I ropes. What a challenge. Obligate anaerobes, um, they can't stand oxygen, right? Why? So let's learn why. We think about oxygen diffusing through the plasma membrane and getting into this bacteria cell. What's going to happen? You form hydrogen peroxide because they react with hydrogen ion and form hydrogen peroxide. They also form, before they form that, they will form the uh, superoxide radicals, which is an oxygen with a negative charge, okay, and a free electron. Uh, this here, this little dot here is an electron. So these reactive oxygen species, this is what they are called, ROS, reactive oxygen species. These substances are super reactive, as their name says, and super toxic. Another one here, peroxide anion, anion, that's how you say it, right? Hydroxyl radical. 
these are all super reactive and they damage the cell. Do we produce them when we breathe? Totally. We totally do all of this. Actually, these substances, a lot of them are super important for cell signaling, but also super important for, to, for when you age. When you age, you accumulate the substances in your cells, right? Why don't we accumulate more or enough to kill us? Because we have enzymes that break them down. So there are enzymes that break down catalase that are called peroxidase. There are enzymes that break down, I said catalase, right? That break down hydrogen peroxide that are called peroxidase or catalase. Ca -ca Whoa. Sorry, it's just delaying catalase. This is catalase. These enzymes break down hydrogen peroxide and neutralize it. Also, there are enzymes that break down superoxide that are called superoxide des dismutase. So there is an enzyme called SOD, superoxide dismutase, that breaks down superoxide radicals. And then they don't make, they don't create the damage in your body. Make sense? Does it make sense why we can tolerate oxygen? Now, obligate anaerobes don't have sod, don't have peroxidase, don't have catalase. They cannot neutralize these radicals. That's why they die, period. Biofilms, let's learn about biofilms. Remember when we talked in chapter four about capsule? gonna write here because I don't give up capsule whoops oh, wow look at that I'm not even touching and it's just going crazy capsule and remember we talked about slime 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 whoops now it's me writing everything wrong Slime layer. Okay, that says slime layer. Capsule and slime layers are made of glycocalyx. These two substances are important to escape phagocytosis, mostly capsule, but slime layer also confer some protection to the bacteria. What is the difference between the two? Slime layer is loose, capsule is hard and it's tight, attached to the cell wall, right? So what does slime layer forms? It's like a hydrogel and it adheres, attaches to surfaces. So when they do that, look what happens. All these little brown, little rod shaped cells here are the bacteria and all this whitish foamy, thing on top, that's the slime layer. The slime layer makes the bacteria grow together in a community. What is a community? They talk, they exchange phone numbers, they exchange WhatsApp messages, all kinds of stuff. They communicate, they send chemical signals to each other, they transfer parts of their genetic material to each other, they share DNA. Not because it's mom making a daughter, mom cell making daughter cells, but because there is horizontal transfer of DNA. Two little friend bacteria can kiss, and we're gonna learn this in the next chapter, and transfer, not next, the chapter eight, transfer genetic material to each other. And what is this genetic material? They can be transferring genes that confer res resistance to antibiotics. So biofilms, are very resistant to antibiotics, okay? They share nutrients, okay? And they shelter, the slime layer helps to shelter this bacteria from environmental factors for something that is harmful in the environment. In which environment? Now I want you to think about where you think you could find biofilms. Water pipes, 
on your sink in that straw that you forgot to wash for a month and you left with juice or something totally um, in your stomach not so much in your intestine a lot there's biofilm in your intestine of bacteria in your uh, mouth mucosa inside your cheek totally they're all there on your teeth even if you brush your teeth got it catheters in inside patient's body all the time is that something that can cause in uh, hospital associate, associated infections yes you see how important they are so biofilms are everywhere okay any smooth surface that has some type of water current or some type of moist that allow for them to grow oh another place you know those cooling towers for air conditioning that has water inside they love it we're gonna talk about what species later like this type of environment okay so oh more examples here heart valves contact lenses okay dental cavities are biofilms okay and another thing that I didn't mention is that clumps can detach from a biofilm, biofilm and form another biofilm in a different location. Crazy, right? Now let's talk about culture. Oh, there is a picture here. That's the biofilm forming on top of some type of fiber. Not sure what that is. Culture media. What's culture media? Is it where the bacteria live? It's like their little, their house? In vitro, is their house in the lab? Yes. Is it also their food? Yes, mostly their food. But different from us, I usually compare my bacteria to my dog. So different from a dog that eats the food from the bowl and then when he's done, he just gets out of you know the, where the bowl is and he's done. The bacteria live in their bowl because they're super tiny, right? So remember, solid or liquid culture medium is where the nutrients are for the microbial growth. Okay, I'm, so, I'm saying bacteria, but of course, if we're talking about fungi, protozoa, all the same. Like they all need a culture medium to grow in a lab, okay? When the medium is sterile, it means there's no microbe in there. When the medium uh, is has bacterial growth you can call that your inoculum okay and a culture is microbes growing in or on a culture medium on if the medium is solid right when is the medium solid when you add agar agar is a polysaccharide that solidifies at around 40 degrees and liquefies at a hundred so it makes it really easy to be used in the lab because it solidifies um, like it's still cooling down but it's liquid but then lower than 40 degrees it gets hot so it, you can it's easy to manipulate and there are some methods that you even grow the bacteria before you solidify the medium you wet the bacteria with the agar medium liquid and then it solidifies with the bacteria in the middle there are some methods that use that uh, and what's important is that usually the bacteria, even though it's a polysaccharide, the bacteria cannot digest it. So they don't make it soft. It continues to be hard even when the bacteria grow on top of it. A chemically defined medium is that has a specific composition. And a complex medium is usually because it has extracts and digests from yeasts, meat, plant, you don't have a specific formula for that. And the complex medium can vary in amount of components because one day you got a batch of plant that is different from the one you got another day. So it's not gonna be always exactly identical, okay? The complex media are the ones we usually use for general growth of bacteria, okay? Reducing medium. Remember, we we're talking about oxygen requirement? There we go. This medium called sodium glycolate com uh, 
combines with the oxygen and depletes oxygen, okay? So what you do is you cultivate anaerobic bacteria in this medium, okay? It's a good medium to grow anaerobes without having to deplete oxygen from everywhere. You just deplete it from the liquid medium called thioglycolate, and then the bacterium grows there. Another way to do an anaerobic environment is using an anaerobic chamber. So this is the chamber here. These are the plates where you're growing your bacteria. So you put them inside this chamber, it's hermetically closed, and the, this is called a gas pack. What is the gas pack? The gas pack has um, hydrogen gas that combines with the air and it has also CO2 and it makes water when combined with the oxygen from the air, meaning the air inside this chamber is depleted. So your anaerobic bacteria can grow here super well. A selective medium is a medium that suppresses unwanted microbes to grow. So you select what's gonna grow and what's not gonna grow. Usually has drugs that kill certain microbes and not others, for example, kill gram positive but not gram negative kind of thing, okay? And a differential medium allows everybody to grow, but you can distinguish the micro microbes on the plate because the colonists are going to have different colors depending on what you're testing. So different, you can test for fermentation here, you can test, most of the time you're testing fermentation, but you can test also presence of enzymes here. Okay, this, the blood agar, is a medium blood agar that uh, is differential. So what happens here is that you have hemolysis, which is bac the bacteria that I call the vampire bacteria, the ones that can break down all the hemoglobin from the blood. So the medium has blood, right? From sheep. So you see this halo that forms around it? This halo is because this part right here is all transparent because the bacteria ate the, the red blood cells. Some bacteria can eat and digest fully red blood cells. Some digest partially. So the ones that digest fully, mm. you call them uh, beta hemolytic. The ones that partially digest the blood, you call them alpha hemolytic. And the ones that grow on the blood because every bacteria likes blood, but don't digest the hemoglobin and the red blood cells and the hemoglobin that is in it, then you call it gamma hemolytic, okay? So you're gonna see that in the lab too. Um, this is a medium that is selective and differential. So why? Because you have a lot of salt in this medium, right? Salt. And salt here makes bacteria, remember I said they're halophiles, bacteria like Staphylococcus grow in this medium. So if you inoculate here, for example, I don't know, Enterococcus is mm. not gonna grow because they can't stand so much salt. But if you grow if you put staphylococcus, they grow. And then what's the difference between the color? So that's that the non-grow and growth defined by the amount of salt is the selective factor. The differential factor is the fact that they can grow in one color or in another color. If they grow pink, that means there is mannitol in this medium. Mannitol salt agar. Mannitol. I am gonna give up one day. Manitol, it's one L, um, is a sugar. If the bacteria eat the sugar, they ferment and produce an acid. Because the medium has phenol red, you see, phenol red turns yellow when the bacteria ferment manitol. So Staphylococcus ferments manitol, produce an acid, and turns the phenol red, which is a pH indicator, yellow. The same one we use for the fermentation medium that I told you in the 
chapter 5. Yeah. Staphia epidermitis cannot ferment mannitol, so it doesn't change the color to yellow. Okay, so that's the differential part of the media. You can distinguish bacteria that can grow in this medium. Enrichment medium is usually used to encourage growth of bacteria that grow really slow or need a lot of uh, nutrients. For example, mycobacteria grow really slow. So you can encourage their growth by adding a specific factor that they need so they can be measured, so they are in a detectable level, right? And you're going to learn in the lab that when we um, talk about pure culture, we um, have a method that is called the strict plate mm. method where you can do one, two, three, or just three or four streaks. And as you're doing this one, two, you're streaking bacteria here, right? As you're streaking them like this, you're diluting them as you drag them. So the last streak, you're going to see these colonies. See? These colonies are... Um, isolated and you can pick each one for identification. Do you agree if there were different bacteria growing here you wouldn't be able to pick one type and not the other but once you have a colony isolated you can do that okay so that's the point of this you're isolating colonies and colonies are already considered to be a pure pure culture. No, it's not working. It's not liking it today. A pure culture, that's what that says, okay? Um, bacterial division, that's the last thing we're going to talk about here. We have binary fission and budding as ways that bacterium grow. Few other bacteria can form spores, which is like it, which is what you see happening with molds, but not bacteria. But there is some type of bacteria that are gram positive that could grow, that can grow as conidiospores, spores, which is something that you see in fungi. So they look like fungi. Um, fragmentation of the filaments is also that is something that you can also rarely see. So most of the cases you see bacteria growing by binary fission. You have one cell with the cell wall, and then the, the, the genetic material duplicates, splitting two, and the cell wall divides in the middle, and then you have two daughter cells that are identical to the mother cell. Mother cell. Is this similar to mitosis? Totally. What's the difference? There is no um, microtubule and... Um, Actually, microtubules you can have some, but you don't have the nuclear organization of the microtubules that draw, uh, driving this separation, okay? Because there's no nucleus. So everything that the nucleus makes, the dust, during mitosis, which is di disintegration, and then the tubules uh, separate the, the genetic material in the, into the two poles, you don't have that happening here, so that's why this is different, okay? You don't have to reform re the nucleus because there's no nucleus here whatsoever. Okay, that's it. So this is the cross wall being formed here, you see? I will talk to you about generation time and how to measure bacterial growth in the second part of this video. Bye-bye, see you soon.